Welcome to this week's episode of the Read Well Podcast. My name is Eddie Hood, and I'm your host, where I believe it's more important to read well than to be well-read. So grab your favorite book, open up your notes, and let's get ready to learn something fascinating. Hey, readers, welcome back to the Read Well Podcast. My name is Eddie Hood, and I am so excited to have you here today for a very special event. This is, in fact, our first guest on the podcast, something I've been meaning to do for quite a long time. It's challenging because I want to bring the best guests possible to you, people who are going to be speaking the same language as us. We have a very unique community here where we are focused on reading well. It kind of goes against the grain a little bit in today's society where everybody's trying to be more productive and find life hacks. Everybody wants to read a thousand books a week, it seems like, and we're all about reading slowly and, and reading for intention. And so Liza Jacob uh, and I got a chance to connect online a little while back, and she is a, an interesting person because she is a audiobook narrator, which I found super fascinating. So uh, as an audiobook narrator, I'll have her tell all of you about her in just a minute. But the reason why I liked her so much is because she has so much passion around the art of reading, not just about getting through books, but to read them well. And through her career, uh, she's learned to sort of embody the voice of the book because she's had to take acting classes and dialect classes and all sorts of crazy things to help her really personify the characters in the books that she's reading. And I thought that would be a fun conversation today. So Liza, welcome to the Read Well podcast. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, this is gonna be a lot of fun. So could you mind just taking a second here and tell us how you got into narrating audiobooks? Sure. Yeah. I have always been a huge audiobook fan. I My first career was being a graphic designer and illustrator. I listened to audiobooks all day, every day. And then mm -hmm. a friend from college posted online that she had narrated an audiobook, and I was floored. I had no idea this was something you could get into. I thought, you know, oh, well, it must be these five voice actors who knew these five casting agents. Good luck. But... Right. So I, I dove in headfirst. I auditioned for some things and I got one of them, which was terrifying. And I completed the book and then went on to complete the series. But I knew I needed training, plain as day. And so then I spent the next two years taking acting classes and narration classes and classes on the business of narrating and being a freelancer working with publishers, what it's like to work with independent authors, all of that. And I've been narrating for five years now. Here's why I love this, this whole experience, because I think audiobooks taught me how to be a better reader. A couple of years ago, I was taking speed reading courses because I had it in my head that if I was going to read all of these books, I needed to read faster, right? There's just too many good books out there. And so I took several speed reading courses and I was, you know, burning through these books and at the end of it, I could tell you sort of what it was about, but I had no idea. I couldn't tell you the details. And I definitely wasn't enjoying myself. I was just reading the book to say that I had read it. And then one day I was sitting there and I was listening to an audiobook, and I can't remember which one it was. But what I remember is that the narrator was reading the book like a conversation, like I was listening to two human beings talking. And he was reading it slowly enough that my brain had the ability to make the connections between what characters were saying and sort of get that nuanced meaning of what they were feeling when they were saying it. And it just became like the book opened up to me because it wasn't about getting it done. It was about enjoying it. I know that's a very simple thing, but I'm really grateful to audiobooks because they they taught me how to slow down and they taught me that it's okay to hear the voice in my head because one of the things in speed reading courses is they tell you to turn that voice off in your head. And they have to tell you, that's bad. Don't, don't listen to the voice in your head. It should be completely silent and you should just be, you know, sight seeing the words. But I found when I turned the voice on, I was a better reader. I'd, I'd love for you to talk about that. What do you think about that? I couldn't agree more. I think the moment you turn the voice off, yeah. you're skipping things. And there's no two ways about it. I mean, yeah, sure. Like if you want to get through a novel and have the rough idea of what it was, go ahead and read the first and last sentence of every big paragraph and just call it a day. But you're not going to know those characters in the same way that if you take your time and just really try to be there. 
I'll even sometimes I'll pre-read the first few paragraphs of a chapter before I actually hit record. And of course, I've prepped the whole book. I've already read the whole thing. But I just want to figure out like, okay, are we standing on a street corner? Are mm -hmm. we hiding from the bad guy in a closet? Like, what's the vibe? Because then that helps you say, okay, she is talking at a mile a minute because they're about to miss the bus or no, she's going really slow because she's just trying to process. You know what I mean? Like it sets such yeah. a different tone and you absorb so much more of what the author is giving you. Amazing people, authors. I don't know how they do it, but they create this entire world, even if it's like a contemporary fiction. And it's so lovely to read slowly because you get so much more of that. I mean, I feel like if you're reading really quickly, you might as well be watching a movie with your back to it while you do the dishes. You're not getting it at all. You know what I mean? Like, honestly, I think when I listen back to some of my samples or books I've recorded, some of the best, most like juicy, like, oh, yes, we really nailed this scene is when I pause, when I'm going really slow. Because if you're reading it and you're like, I had no idea you were here the whole time. I had no idea you were here the whole time, right? Like, it's just so, and it's when different. you allow yourself, yeah, when you allow yourself the space to do that as you read, 10 out of 10. Uh, I love what you said in the very beginning of where are we at? You mentioned that when you pre-read the book, the paragraph, you're saying, okay, where are we at? What are we feeling? And you instantly are just inserting yourself into the book, right? Instead of saying what's happening in the book, where is the book located? You're saying, where are we at? And so you're already taking that mentality of like, I'm reading because I want to be running around London with Pip in Great Expectations, right? I want to be, I want to be in those societal rooms, you know, watching people try to like outdo each other. That's why I'm reading Great Expectations. I'm not doing it just to say, oh, I read Great Expectations. Good for me, you know. So I like first of all that you're you're saying where are we at, and then you also said what's the vibe of what's happening right now. I think that's really important because I had somebody on Facebook a couple of days ago reach out to me and, and say that he's really grateful for the conversations we're having because he's always been a fast reader and hasn't gotten anything out of it. And he said, I just realized this week that there's absolutely no point to what I'm doing. There's no reason to be reading this fast. And he said, I tried slowing down this weekend and for the first time ever, like I really enjoyed my book. And he used that word space, which is interesting because you just said, I need to give myself space. So when you're reading, what does that mean, Liza? What is space? Sometimes I'll just sit with something. Like if I get to a spot where I am trying to really envision, like a lot of times with scene setting, you know, they're describing the ballroom you've walked into and like just sit with that for a second and think about like, what it looks like, what would that feel like? You know what I mean? Like just really trying to envision the space or the same thing with big emotion, right? When you have some mm -hmm. unbelievable, like, you know, Pip finds out, well, I don't wanna give spoilers. I don't, <laughs> do we give spoilers? I don't know. We, we just actually read Great Expectations in my book club, so. Okay, um, so it's is it safe to say? <laughs> It probably still isn't because who knows who's going to be watching oh, okay. this. Okay, fair. Yeah. Okay, but yeah. when you get to a moment where a character has their world change, just fall out mm -hmm. from underneath of them, or the opposite, it's mm -hmm. just like, oh, oh my goodness, this person's in love with, like, just sit with that for a second. Like, what would that feel like in your body? You know what I mean? Like, am I tense? And as a voice actor, I'm like, okay, that's going to change my voice intensely, right? Like, mm -hmm. is this a shoulders relax moment and your pitch drops and your cadence is smoother? Or is it like, oh my God, like the shoulders go in and you're more staccato. Yeah. Like, what does that feel like? Sorry, am I answering the question? <laughs> no, that's actually perfect. I read to my kids every night. Uh, um, my kids all love books and it's because we've read together every night for 20 years. My kids all just come in at night, right? 8.30 at night, everybody rolls into the littlest bedroom. They all sit around dad <laughs> and we read for like 30 minutes yeah. every night. I love it. But one of the things I found is that I get in trouble if I don't do the voices of the characters. So I have to do all of the voices. And it's really tricky because I have to remember what each character sounds like. And I have to try to kind of do a little bit of acting. 
And I'm not an actor. I'm an accountant, right? By day, this is not in me to do this, but it's a lot of fun. I'm curious because you went to acting school a little bit to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? Really fun. <laughs> because of COVID, a lot of what I did was online. But just before COVID, I got to do some in-person, like improv classes were really fun. Yeah, yeah, super fun. It's just been such a treat to get to do because I find it so enjoyable, regardless of the fact that, you know, I needed to grow at work or, you know, it's a requirement of the job. Like, it's just a lot of fun. And yeah. I feel like 90 percent of it is do you believe it yourself? Right. Are you allowing yourself to make believe enough that you're like, oh, my gosh, we are hiding in the closet or like, oh, my gosh, we're on a boat. Like whatever the thing is, like, are you allowing yourself to really be present and to really take up space within that novel, like to be in there, like wedge yourself down in between the characters. And yeah, I think there's no way to do that if you're slamming through the book. There's no way to do that if you are just like, okay, next page, okay, next chapter. You know what I mean? There's no room for that. And when I read the book the first time around, I prep it, which entails obviously reading. Mm. And then I keep a spreadsheet. And the first sheet is like the synopsis of every chapter, two or three sentences, just quickie, like remind you who's there. And mm. on that, I have every character with a speaking line or with like a something that I'm going to need to remember. OK, we've got to bring back the sheriff voice. So, you know, listen to that like voice file. Shakespeare a little bit here. Think about the Shakespeare it's, plays, right? You've got that synopsis in the beginning and then all over the characters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then the next sheet is character descriptions. And, you know, because as you're reading, you got to read slow enough that you catch, oh, he has a Scottish accent. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're reading too fast, you miss these things and mm -hmm. all their voice files. And then the last one is, and I've only started this doing this year, I will do the emotional arc of the story. And I have like, it's almost like a heat map of little color coded blocks to just get an idea for like, okay, it's light and airy in the beginning and it's all giggles. And then, you know, oh, there's the robbery and now we're picking up the intensity and what is everybody feeling? And just really helping myself keep the whole book cohesive in my mind. Because mm. I think one of the best things about reading slow is you have an infinitely better understanding of that work, as we've been saying. But one of the drawbacks for me can be if we have this huge epic fantasy novel, oh, I'm yeah. only really present in what's happened in the last two or three chapters, right? Like in the You've same like way that like- characters in those things, right? Yeah. Yes. And, you know, the same way I couldn't tell you what I had for dinner four days ago, right? <laughs> and I love the heat map because it keeps me thinking like, you know, I sit down at the desk that day. OK, like, where are we in the greater span of this? Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, clearly, if you're uh, a reader, you're, most of us aren't training to be audiobook narrators. So you don't need to. We're not suggesting you keep spreadsheets for every book that you no, read. No, no. <laughs> but, but I think what we are trying to say is something that's really important, that that every character deserves his or her due attention. And every scene requires just a moment of like thought before you just read through the page, right? I talked about my kids earlier and reading to them. And the reason why I wanted to bring that up is because that experience has made reading better for me. Because now when I go and read my own books, I just by habit, I've got the voices going in my head and I'm reading slower. I have to read slower to my kids because I've got a nine-year-old. I can't blow through that book. So we read 10 pages a night. So we're reading rather slowly. And it has just made my own personal reading experience better. And what I want to point out is that you're going to be pretty bad at this at first. If you haven't done this ever, it's going to feel awkward and maybe even like a waste of time because you're, you're trained to like check off boxes and be ambitious and the American dream, like go achieve as much as possible. So you're going to want to read quickly. And so slowing down and trying to see the scene and the characters is probably going to be hard for you. But I talk about it all the time on the podcast. There's this thing called reading stamina, and you don't have a lot of it in the beginning, right? But if you can do this for five minutes and work up to 60 minutes, you know, over the course of a month or so, it's very doable and, and reading becomes far more enjoyable. 
So it's so you ever feel that, that reading stamina thing. Yes. A thousand percent. I remember how it mm -hmm. felt to record those first few books. And yeah. like, if you were telling me to go on like emotional memory, I'd be like, oh man, those were long. I looked back the other day, they were an hour. And like, <laughs> I've done books that are 12 hours long. And I was like, huh? Okay. But they yeah. felt monstrously big. One of the other things I noticed, this was when I was training to be a narrator and I was comfortable reading like a picture book out loud. Mm. But as my daughter got older and my older daughter and I was reading to her and we started reading novels, I sounded very stilted. You know, I'd miss things. I'd paraphrase. It's a skill. It's a muscle. Right. And so you really do have to build up that muscle. No one's good at it when they start. Literally no one. Yeah. Like you listen to my yeah. first recorded book. It's under a pseudonym. No one can find it. Huh? But <laughs> it was so rough. It was so yeah. rough. And now, like, you know, it's what I do for a living. It's and better. I love yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And and yeah. always learning. Like who isn't in their job? But the other thing that both myself and my older daughter have found is you are looking to sort of give your reading muscle exercise, but for whatever reason, like you can't make yourself sit down with that novel or the, you know, heavy mm -hmm. text. I love graphic novels for this because mm -hmm. it's hard not to be drawn in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I love them. Mm -hmm. And my daughter and I right now are reading one at night together. And like you're saying about not racing through them, there's way less text on the page and it is easy to race through a graphic novel. And I am yeah. trying to stop and will like in between dialogue printed on the page, talk about, oh, my gosh, that's a beautiful illustration. Look at those mountains or like, you know, make noises that aren't called out. Right. Like she opens a door in the image and like I'll make the creek to like, you know, what <laughs> I mean, like and it implies pace. Right. Like the character was tentative about opening that door. So now. We've slowed down again to become better immersed uh -huh. again because we're uh -huh. just living in their pace. And I, I love it. It's, you know, when your brain is exhausted, but you're like, I want to read yeah. graphic novels. Yeah. 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 I, I had a flat or not a flashback, but it made me think of those like 1920s radio shows where they'd have the people talking. Then there would be the sound yeah. effects guy in the corner with like wood blocks and stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Adding to the, the effects. Yeah. Foley artist or something? I don't know. I, I have no be. idea. But yes. But we need, no. we need one of those every time we read books. So when we're reading fiction, I, I think there's a couple reasons why we're doing it, right? We're reading fiction, one, because we've had a long, busy day. And we're going to be talking about nonfiction, too, because this all applies to nonfiction as well, maybe slightly different, mm -hmm. but we're starting with fiction here. I at least read fiction, one, because I've had a long day and I'm tired. And I would like to, I mean, let's be honest, life is a little older me. It's a little monotonous at times, right? You got to pay the bills. You got to clean the house. You got to just, and it's every day the same day. So reading a book allows you to go on the pirate ship. It allows you to escape and do random things. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, and I have yet to hear people say that the movie was better than the book, right? So if you can read the books, you're going to have a far more enjoyable time than even watching the movies. So that's number one. But number two, I think one of the reasons why at least our community reads books is because we're looking for some emotional intelligence. The people that watch the Readwell podcast are very intelligent people. They uh, like to read philosophy and psychology and all of these other things. And so when you're reading a book, you're also trying to get another worldview. Because I live in Utah, for example, and I don't know what it's like to be other races or other genders or other, you know, religions or other anything. I just know my life. That's all I know. And so reading a book allows me to realize that, oh, there are other ways to live this world, and they're quite beautiful. So, for example, if you read The Color Purple, that's a life I have no experience with, right? But it's a fantastic book. And when you read it, you walk away with some emotional intelligence. You walk away with some understanding of human pain and the human condition. And you're a little kinder to people on the street because you have some education behind you, right? So I think that's the second reason why we read. And if you read quickly, you get neither of those. Yeah. You get neither the escape and enjoyment, and you definitely don't have time for the emotional intelligence because it, it takes time to learn something new. 
Uh, yeah. you, you have to let the, the connections sort of, you know, come together. And I think I, I, I had an interesting ex experience this weekend. I was reading something for our book club and it was a paragraph that should have taken me 15 seconds to read, right? But it took me like 45 minutes to read this paragraph because I had, mm -hmm. my kids were banging around the house and it was a really complex thing. And I think that that's okay. If it takes you 45 minutes to read a paragraph and understand it, like, that's okay. It's perfectly fine. I think we need to give ourselves the permission to be slow readers sometimes. Yes, and to reread. I can't tell you how mm -hmm. many times when you're listening, or sorry, when you're reading mm -hmm. a new author's work, or at least like new to me, you're getting in someone else's head. And it's unsurprising they're going to phrase things differently or see things differently than you. And so there are times in almost every new author to me book when I'm prepping, mm -hmm. and I'm like, that's not a sentence. I have no idea what you're saying. These words are gibberish. I, mm -hmm. I don't understand. And I'll read the sentence out loud like four times. And I'm like, oh, that's the first phrase. And this is the second phrase. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. every single time. And every once in a while, and this just happened, high fantasy, super long novel, his pacing and cadence, just the melody of his thoughts wildly different from mine. And he wrote me an email. He was like, oh, this was so great. Thank you so much. Love this chapter. You read this sentence in a way that that was, I don't think we understand each other. <laughs> He's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, you did that wrong. I said the words. He's like, "You, there's no pickup. There's no, like, you didn't say the words, the wrong words. It was just like, I did not understand, apparently. And that happens. Context. And but yeah, like, be kind to yourselves, man. Like, it's, yeah. No one's perfect, yeah. and so no one's going to read it perfectly. And also, just, I think, admit that you're never going to read all these books. By the time you die, you're not going to get to all of them. So stop trying to get to all of them. You know, you'll never catch up to that. There's a, a Stoic philosopher, his name is Seneca, and he wrote in a book, it's called Letters to a Stoic. And in book number two, he suggests that we stop trying to read thousands of authors, but instead spend our lives with a couple of really critical authors and actually learn something, you know. And whether you agree with that or not, you know, the idea of maybe sticking with three to five authors your whole life might be confining for you. But what he's trying to say is like, look, if you were to pick five authors who were truly influential and you were to spend your life studying their best books like Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, right, This you could spend your whole life reading this thing and still be learning from it, you would probably be better off and happier if you did that than having read a thousand books and be like, I kind of know what's going on. So, yeah. There are no awards um, for having read a thousand books. No awards. Well, oh, let's talk about that for a minute. I think that's interesting. Sure. So my, I have a nine-year-old who's in elementary school right now, and the reading programs are training him to read quickly, right? That all the homework is just, they're timing him. How many words can you get a minute? And he's just, he's having to move through these books. And then they've got this big like gold star system where if you can read 300 books in the year, you get an award kind of thing. And it's really frustrating to me because, well, even so, I'll sit down with the teachers in parent-teacher conference and they'll say, you know, he reads really fast, but his comprehension is not where we want it to be. And I'm like, no kidding, lady. Like you've got him reading 300 books a year. Of course he doesn't know what he's reading. But they're giving him a gold star on this big chart. They just all the kids as they get these books. And they have a big pizza party if they can all hit these, this ridiculous number. I'm just frustrated that that's how we're teaching our kids to read, you know? It's um, not good. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sure the teachers true. are lovely people and everyone's doing their best. Oh, but they are. I share that frustration. It's It doesn't set a good precedent. And, like, mm -mm. the books my—I also have a nine-year-old. The books my nine-year-old reads— that she receives the most joy from are the ones she's read 10 times. She yeah. thinks those jokes are still awesome. And now she's really getting on the 10th read all the context of like really noticing what Ramona and Beezus are big for us. And oh, so, you man. know, like the little, yes, they're so good. And the exasperation and the, the whatever. And I don't know how they're like 40 years old. They're they're not new. I love Ramon and Beezus. Those were good. When I was a kid, I loved those. I still love they're, those. They're fabulous. Yeah. And they're still like yeah. completely I don't know why they're so like good. they're just good. Oh, they're genius. They're just wonderful. Yeah. But yeah, she's read it ten times. And nice. You know, 
There's yeah. just no reason for her to be buzzing through. Take your time. Thousand bucks. Yeah. 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 Good. I thought it would be fun if we were to take a minute and talk about nonfiction really quickly, because when people yeah. hear us talk, they're gonna they're gonna say, "Well, of course, this applies to the fiction readers. Of course, they want to escape and they want to hear the voices." But I'm a nonfiction reader. I'm a learner. I got a lot to learn. I got to read all these books. Or I'm a student. Even worse, mm. I go to college. And I've got like huge amounts of reading assignments every week that I have to get through. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to enjoy what I have to read. You know, I would love mm -hmm. to talk about that because the nonfiction readers are definitely programmed to do checkbox, like to do lists, right? And to yeah. just like learn and grow and learn and grow. And there just doesn't seem to be any time in between all of the learning to do any of the growing sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah. how does this apply to nonfiction? What are your thoughts there? It's exactly the same thing. It always breaks my heart when people are, they're like, oh, well, you know, anyone can narrate a nonfiction. It's not like an acting thing. And I'm like, it 100% is. <laughs> because if you are completely separated from the emotional impact, mm -hmm. what are you doing? Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's so one of the classic things, if you're taking a class on narrating nonfiction, they say is your goal is to empathize or convince or persuade or inform. And those things all have real emotional connection and will take time. Like there are some passages where you're like, OK, this is clearly a list form paragraph and we're learning mm -hmm. the 10 parts of this, you know, whatever, mushroom, dishwasher, mm -hmm. parenting style. And OK, so we're going to hit the things. We know the pace on hitting this this list, right? There's a mental pace. And then there's a sort of a proof paragraph, like why that list is meaningful. Mm -hmm. And those I always look out for like a, a pivot word is sort of how I think of them, where they're like, although all of these pieces of the mushroom are important, then there's all, like there will be a pivot word like however. And you're like, oh, now they're going to get us, right? Slow down. Yeah. When you hear those, mm -hmm. take a breath because that's going to be the sentence that you actually walk away remembering. And if you're racing, you're going to miss it. You'll remember part of the list and you're going to forget or not understand the impact of what they're trying to impart. And for me, that's something I, when I do read nonfiction, hands mm -hmm. down, the most important bit. And I feel like... That's good advice. If you're reading nonfiction and you catch yourself like glazing over, you're going too fast. Or if you're reading nonfiction and you are a little bit glazing over and forgetting, maybe we go back and reread. And like I reread all the time in nonfiction because I'll lose sight of like, OK, but if this were a person in the room, how would their voice sound? Right. Mm -hmm. Are they my pediatrician explaining to me why I really do need to bother with those little eyedroppery things to give her the vitamins? Like, ugh. but she's like, nope, because, you know, and like, is it that sort of pace or is it like someone sitting down and holding your hand and saying something like really intense mm -hmm. and they feel differently? And if you can picture that person, either you are the person explaining or you're being explained to, mm -hmm. I find I always understand the text better. One thing I know about myself is I am not the smartest guy in the room. I'm definitely not a genius. And so when I read a book, I think people who can really cruise through nonfiction and read quickly and understand it, that's like one in a thousand, right? The other 999 yeah. of us are like normal people. And it takes a minute to like, well, there, there are those people that can do that, right? And good for them. I am not one of those people. I have like, so... Let's take, for example, I mean, let's say you're reading an autobiography by Gandhi, or, or let's say you're reading Richard Feynman's lecture notes on physics or something, whatever you're interested in. That stuff deserves attention. That's mm -hmm. like you, you, you're going to be learning from one of the smartest people that has ever walked on the face of the earth, who has a serious and profound message to share with you and has spent probably 30, 40, 50 or 60 years of their life condensing that message into a 300 page book yeah. you know what i'm saying like yeah you get for for nine dollars and 99 cents you get to get 40 years of somebody's life all of their hard work 
all of their intelligence, and you get to download that into your brain. But if it took them 40 years to not only learn it, but to like figure out how to say it, it, this isn't a book that should be read in eight hours. You know, it might take a while and that's probably okay. When you're learning something complicated, I think it's okay to give yourself plenty of time to read it. Uh, sometimes I'll pick up a book. So what, what I like to do before I read a book, if, if I know it's going to be challenging work, is I like to find any YouTube videos, articles, essays about that author in that book to like teach uh -huh. me about that concept before I yeah. read the book. Because there's no spoilers in nonfiction. So I can read people's, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I can read yeah. their their rundowns, their synopses, their, okay. Like if you're reading Nick McKee and Ethics again, there are, there are so many things online that will tell you how to approach this work that will give you tips, that will give you insights, that will, and there are lecture notes from philosophers around the country or philosophy professors, but they're contemporary people. So they're writing in a way that is your current form of English. Mm -hmm. His words don't always feel contemporary, right? So if you yeah. can start with something familiar and you can be taught by all of these people and then read the book, you're going to do a month of work. It's much like you getting ready for an audiobook. You're going to do a month of work yeah. before you do the work, you know? Mm -hmm. But you have to ask yourself, why are you reading Nick and McKee and Ethics? Are you doing it to try and look and feel smart? Or are you doing it because you actually want to learn what Aristotle's talking about, which is the main object of life, which is happiness? This whole book's about how to find real happiness in life. If that's of interest to you, then maybe do some work, put the work in. It takes time to learn something hard. <laughs> it know? does. It does. I'm kind of overwhelmed by the amount of resources out there that are offering these book summaries. So I just mentioned looking them up. But one of the things that's frustrating me online is that people are saying, I read the book summary on all of like SparkNotes or Blinkist or something, you know, the, uh, which are great apps. They're not apps for me in the way I, I study, but that's fine. But they're then saying, because I read the summary, I read the book. And that's not the same as reading the book, right? I can listen to the eight minute summary of Nick and McKean ethics on one of those platforms, but that doesn't count as reading the book. You know, like I said, a lot of philosophy professors have been reading this book for 30 years and they're still reading the book and that's okay. You know, that's okay. okay. Hey everyone. I want to take just a quick second in the middle of this podcast to tell you about highlightish.com. Think of highlighting a book, but add I S H at the end. Highlightish.com is the tool that I use to make better book notes and to organize my writing. It's where I go to capture my favorite passages, annotate them, and then to turn that research into essays, blog posts, or research papers. If you're someone that wants to get more out of the books that you love and you want to turn that into great output, go to highlightish.com today. Thanks for listening and let's get back to the show. Well, I thought it would be fun now to just take a second uh, and go through. I picked three books. One, there's a fiction book here. I got a, a small poem and then I've got some Aristotle. And I thought it would be fun just to read a paragraph from each and talk about how we might approach that as readers. How do you feel about Perfect. that? Perfect. I love it. Good? All right. Okay. So this is a fun book, everybody. I've talked about this on the, the channel before. This is The Master and Margarita. This is a Russian novel by Mikhail Bulgakov. If you were looking for something completely surreal and visually beautiful and a really good opportunity to practice your character and your pacing and your the, everything that Liza is teaching us, this is a great book to do that on. I mean, just look at the cover. That alone just tells you you're going to go for a ride with this thing, right? So Mikhail does a great job, but we're going to read just a paragraph here. And there is a, there's a point in this. Well, I don't want to give away any sections. We're just going to read here. Okay. So it says, good morning. Ivan did not reply, considering such a greeting inappropriate under the circumstances. Indeed, they lock up a healthy man in a clinic and pretend that that is how it ought to be. The woman, meanwhile, without losing her good-natured expression, brought the blinds up with one push of a button and sun flooded the room through a light and wide mesh grill which reached right to the floor. Beyond the grill, a balcony came into view. Beyond that, the bank of a meandering river. And on its other bank, a cheerful pine wood. Time for our bath, the woman invited. Okay, so that's a small section of the book. Mm -hmm. I picked that section because we've got two characters. I didn't get into the voices or anything, but there's also something visually happening. It's presenting a, a scene, right? Mm -hmm. Guys in a mental institute and 
the nurse is coming to give him his bath, right? And this guy is, is considers himself to be healthy, but he's frustrated he's in a mental institute. So, Man. Um, yeah. So when you're reading fiction like that, this is a bit of a, an interesting book because there is a lot of surrealism in it. But how might we approach a scene like that? Because we're talking about sun coming in and we're talking about the balcony and the wooded forest. I don't know. What are your thoughts as you heard that passage? Yeah, I... There's, I love, and again, this is the magic that authors have that is, as you said, acting's not in your body, writing, not, mm -hmm. I, I have so yeah, much respect for it. But the author used so few and so carefully chosen terms and words. Mm -hmm. I can picture this guy just like sitting in bed being like, Ugh, right? Like, yeah. that's his vibe. And she's like, we're going to do this. I really yeah, want you to go. be, come on, here we go. Get excited. Like, yeah. and it, yeah. you can like feel the tension between those two. And then using the blinds opening to tell us about their space, right? Mm -hmm. He's not in the basement. The The light flooded in. Okay, well, what does that feel like? You know what I mean? And And then we get this sort of tableau. It sounds really pretty out there, right? Like, there's a body of water and there's trees and it sounds really lovely. And she's trying to bring the vibe up, right? And he doesn't even want her to say good morning. It's not a good morning, mm -hmm. right? And that tension, that pulling of like, that was, I, it's oftentimes I find the scenes where if you were to just listen to the spark notes, whatever, I, like I mm -hmm. haven't used them. So maybe you read the spark notes. I don't know. But if you were to just. I don't use them either, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But if you were, they'd be like, if that moment was even mentioned, it would be the nurse came in the room, she gave him a bath. Exactly. And you'd miss yeah. all of that, like, all, and that's the juice, right? Like, mm -hmm. do you want a steak or do yeah. you want a cardboard children's toy that looks like a steak? I want or do you steak. want a picture of a steak? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Correct. A yeah. digital image of yeah. a steak. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I love that scene because it tells us so much about, like, you know, I imagine, even though he hates being in the mental institution, if they've got a view like that and he's mm -hmm. got a room with a window of a view like that and she's working this hard to be kind, it's probably actually a, like of all the mental institutions you can be in, not a bad one, right? Like you're learning so much about yeah. the story and like it's a nothing scene. It's not a nothing scene. There's Oh, sorry, no. I get excited. A lot. <laughs> no, see, okay, so I got to tell all of you something interesting about Liza. Like, I did not prep her at all for these three passages. No. She has no idea what we're reading. But the fact that she was able to listen that well and not even see the text and then get that much out of it is what we want for you as a reader. We want you to hear a passage or read a passage and get more than just the words out of it. And I hope you can also hear her enthusiasm for what we read, which is which is what I want. I want people to I want people to read books because it's fun and enjoyable, not because you have to. But yeah, there's a lot happening in that scene. It, you know, there might even be some metaphor at play there too, right? Like if he's in a mental institute, he's not enjoying life, and then the sun comes in. Like, is there a little bit of a metaphor there that like you're locked in this place, but outside, if you can get your life together, right? There's beauty outside and there's all of that. So it makes me think about what would it feel like to actually be stuck in a mental institute if I thought I was healthy? I never met anybody that has gone through that. But I have had people who were sick and in hospice care and other things and didn't feel like, well, they felt like their pride was being attacked or whatever. If the nurse had to come in and give them a sponge bath, like it was just embarrassing and yeah. it's hard and I don't want to do it, you know, but it brings back all of those memories. And all of a sudden I'm a little closer to what it means to be a human. Yeah. Because one day... I will be super old and I will probably need help. And so when you read these books, you can just hear the story or you can think to yourself like, what does this mean? How does this relate to being human? I think every yeah. story that's ever been written is to help us understand what it means to be human. That's why we're doing it. That's why we're telling these stories, you know? So Yeah, 100%. Good. Let's read some poetry. All right. Emily Dickinson is my favorite poet. This is a small poem. It's only got eight lines to it, but it's one of her more popular ones. She didn't ever title her poems because she didn't intend for them to be published. I think she published seven poems oh. in her life, but she's got, oh wow, I think 1,700 poems she wrote. 
they were um, published um, after her death. And many people went through and cataloged all of her work and what have you. So the first line of each poem tends to be the title that we give it usually because she didn't have one. So the, the first line in this one is, tell all the truth, but tell it slant, right? Ooh. So this is, a, this is a line that is used a lot in English circles, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. So this is a small poem about how we should tell the truth but you have to reveal it gradually. Otherwise, you'll you could do a lot of harm, right? With just blatant truth. All right. So tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success and circuit lies. So she's talking about being circuitous here, right? Don't just go straight to it. Be a little circuitous as you're doing this. Mm. Too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise. As lightning to children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Wow. So that's the, that's the whole poem. It's a very good poem, but I, I find poetry is the hardest of all things for me to read, because especially Dickinson, because she's got like layers upon layers of meaning. She, she was a genius on so many levels. And so when you read her poem, I read it self-consciously because I'm like, I know I'm not getting the meaning. I have no idea what she's saying, <laughs> you know, but then, yeah. you know, you can take classes on just single poems of hers. And as you talk, as you listen to people talk about her poems, people just start pulling apart the meaning and you're like, whoa, like this woman was crazy deep, but that's a, that's an easy one. So again, I'm going to read it really quickly for the listeners. Cause it's only eight lines. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant success in circuit lies too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Wow. I, yeah, I don't know that there's a lot of audiobook narration in the world of poetry, but I want to open this up for just a minute because poets, you were talking about how authors have this innate talent to pick the right words to convey meaning right? And how they are really good at that. I think poets are probably the best at that because they've only got so much space. And in her case, I've got eight lines to tell a very big story. So she was very much on purpose with each word. So I would just love to get your thoughts on poetry. Yeah, I agree with you that it's, for me, uh, far more challenging mm -hmm. to, I mean, and I'm glad you reread it because I I would yeah, be sitting there just like, oh, back to the top, back yeah, to the top. Yeah. Yep. Man, what a gift of words. I, it's well, let, amazing. Let's, let's, let's just look at the first line. And that, that, that's sure. it. And yes. Maybe this will yes. help people understand why poetry is worth reading. Because I think a lot of people now will brush poetry off. Like, that's mm -hmm. something they used to do in the 19th century. That's when the romantics were here, right? That's when we had poetry. Mm -hmm. But we don't read poetry anymore. We read nonfiction books about health and like, you know, how to lose weight. And that's what, that's the book sure. I read. Yes. No Understanding cryptocurrency. Anymore. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so I want to try and bring poetry back a little bit because I think there's immense value in it because of the choice of words. It helps me appreciate the English language far better, but it also helps me pay attention to the deeper meaning that an author is presenting. So first line is tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Well, what is she saying here? She's saying you should tell all the truth. But what does all mean? Does all mean all the things or does it mean all the people? Right? Is she saying, tell all your friends and family the truth? Or is she saying, tell everything you know and never tell a, even a white lie? <clears throat> because that, there's a little bit of a difference there. This yeah, poem all of a sudden sure. starts to like, it adds just a little bit of like, mystery now all of a sudden that second word tell all the truth well who's all right yeah that's yeah so does that mean that i can tell mostly lies but in this one instance where it's like really important i should tell everybody i know what i did should i get up and at the microphone and tell everybody hey i committed adultery <laughs> <laughs> right something like that right like just yeah. boom you know is yeah. that what you're supposed to do which i have it by the way people i'm a very faithful no person, by the way. but that's a really strong example of like I was trying to think of something that would be really like eating at your core. Mm -hmm. Are you supposed to get up in front of your 
boss and your family and grab a microphone and go tap, hey, just so you all know, I did this. Or is she saying you should tell every possible truth all day long? And that's a different way of looking at it. And then the next line, but tell it slant, the mm. second half, right? Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to tell it slant? Why did she pick that word? And that's why I like yeah. poetry. It's really lovely. And I think your point earlier is so dead on that their space is so limited. They mm -hmm. are cutting right to the mm -hmm. the thick of it. We are in mm -hmm. there right away, right? Mm -hmm. And no prologue. And it's why I think people can find it challenging because you're meant to sit with it. No one's mm -hmm. going to successfully race through a book of poetry. It would just be no. like word soup. And yeah. I, I, I find myself inarticulate in even discussing this poem because I'm still thinking about the first like four words. <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to you're not supposed to have a response to it. I mean, I've read that poem yeah. many times and I'm still like, oh, OK, where are we going with this? That poem alone, it's only eight lines, but poetry professors, English professors could probably spend two whole class periods just talking sure. about those eight lines and never get bored of talking about the yeah. eight lines, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. they could spend, if a class is three hours long, that's six hours they could talk about those. That's an hour per line almost, you know? Wow. It's really nuts yeah. how, how, yeah. how deep she is. But I like what you just said, Liza, which was perfect, that I'm not, I feel a little inarticulate on this point because there's a lot to think about and you have to sit with it. I think that's why poetry is so valuable. It teaches you to stop and sit with it and to get that rush out of your system and just go, you know what? I'm going to work on this one line today. <laughs> that feels yes. very inefficient. But you know what? If you were to do that, if you were to sit for an hour today and just think about Emily's first line, tell all the truth, but tell a slant. And you you went for a walk with your dog and you thought about that line, you know? Mm. What does she mean? What is she talking about? Why did she write this poem? Emily was a recluse. She lived in her home in the second floor of her house. She never came out. She wouldn't even let people see her face, right? Except for some of the local children. She would let them, she would throw candy to them from her window at times, but nobody ever saw Emily. She just lived in her bedroom her whole life. And so why would a woman like that write this poem? You know, did something happen to her? What kind of message is she trying to get out? Was she scared? Was she phobic? Like, what's going on? There's just a lot of stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah. But we start thinking about that, like, apply to my own life. Like, do I tell the truth? How do I feel in moments of challenge? We talk about a lot of philosophy here. So that means we're talking about virtues and what do you consider to be right versus wrong? What do you consider to be you know, morally ethical? So mm -hmm. for you personally, you know, and I'm not asking you, but the, the listener, yeah. like, what do you consider is the time to tell all the truth? Do you think it's okay to lie at times? Personally, I do. I think it's okay to lie at times because there are times when I know the person I'm talking to simply cannot handle this story at the moment. And I have to like guide them through that, right? There are just, mm -hmm. you have to use your judgment at times, especially as a father. Like I have to like help my kids navigate the complexities of life sometimes. So anyway, but we're all different. Some people feel like, no, you have to tell the truth all the time, always and forever, you know, and yeah. we're all different. So there you go. Totally true. Okay. I saved the, the, the best and the worst for last. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nervous. So, yeah, no. So I, now you, you've you not read this book and I've, this is a book you can read, like I said, for 30 years and still be like, well, okay, what's going on here? Yeah. So Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, this, many people feel like this is a collection of his lecture notes. And the reason why they feel that way is because he bounces around a lot. Sometimes he self, he contradicts himself. Sometimes he even says things similar to, grab that chart and bring it over here. Like, now we'll look at this chart sort of thing, you know? So it's not done in a presentational way. It's almost like students just took notes and then that got compiled and these are the Nick and McCain ethics. But we're going to read not even a full paragraph here. We're going to read two, two sentences. But I'm going to read them slowly because I want the listener to pay attention to what it's like to read something now intellectually challenging. And I'm doing this because I want you to give yourself permission, one, to read hard stuff, but two, know that you're supposed to read it slowly. It's supposed to go slow, right? All right, so this is book two, chapter six. And in book two, Aristotle is trying to teach us what virtue is. And what he says is that virtue is usually the characteristic caught between two extremes, right? So 
you have, let's call it courage. Courage is caught between two extremes of cowardice and overconfidence, right? So cowardice and overconfidence, those are vices. So if you're a coward and you run and hide and you blame everybody for everything, that's a vice. That's a bad thing. If you're overconfident and you walk in a room and you're boastful and you think you're better than everybody else, that's a vice. That's a bad thing. But right in the middle, you've got courage, right? You know what's harmful. You're willing to go out and defend against it. Even though you're scared, that's virtue. And so he's trying to say with everything, whether it's being frugal with money, the example there would be if you're good with your money right in the middle, that's a virtue. But if you're just like shooting Benjamins all over the place and giving everybody all your money and spending it on wine and women, and all that stuff, that's a vice. But if you're also so stingy with your money that you won't help anybody and you won't, right, see where this is going? Like, so Aristotle says, like, we're trying to go for the middle of all these characteristics. That's usually where the virtuous person lives. That's the background of this. So these two sentences, and again, I don't expect Liza to comment on this, but just to talk about how we might read it if we are studying something complex. He says, yet one ought to say not only this, that virtue is a characteristic, but also what sort of characteristic is it? So it must be stated that every virtue both brings that of which it is, the virtue, into good condition and causes the work belonging to that thing to be done well. Okay, that's all I'm going to read. So the, the, the problem with philosophy is that we're, we're not talking about concrete things. Uh, and it, do, it doesn't have to be philosophy. It can be psychology. It can be chemistry. It can be whatever. Sometimes you're dealing with amorphous, just mental things. It's so much easier to read a passage about a pen because I can pick up a pen and hold it and know what it feels like and be like, yeah, I get it. It's a pen. But when you're talking yes. about virtue, I can't pick up virtue and hold it. I can't smell it. I can't. There's no senses. It's all done up here, right? So, you know, he's saying, hey, virtue is something that causes the work belonging to it to be done well. So what he's trying to say is, if you're going to be a virtuous person, you need to do what you do best, which is narrate audiobooks, right? And you need to do it well. You need to do that with virtue and show up every day. That's how you're going to find your happiness is if you do what you do well and you Try to stay away from all of those vices on the extremes as you do it. That's really what he's getting at here. Mm. But let's take a second and talk about this. We can't really apply character voices to that stuff so much. There are no character no. voices in this. What do you think? But I, you can't apply character voices, right? But I feel when I was listening to you speak, mm -hmm. I was listening just as much to how you were interpreting like the pitch and the flow and like, mm. where is your head as you read this? Because that helps me understand what it is we're saying and how we're coming at it. Mm. Because, and like, again, that's something you can only do it if you're reading slow and you're letting that voice in your head talk. Mm. Because mm. there are moments where, you know, he's explaining and you can almost... And you did this as well when you read, slowed down, right? Mm. Like that this is a moment we are hearing, like that that's the conclusion. This is the what we are finding, right? That you have to do it well. From a narration standpoint, if you read at exactly the same pace, all of that gets lost. And more power to you if you can listen to nonfiction read by AI where it's all the same pace. I mm -mm. don't know how you would get through because it's driving the, nuts. I know oh, it would. I'm like, there are times where, you know, like it happens and people like it, I guess that's good for them. I cannot make it because mm -mm. hearing you interpret that text, you naturally hear like, OK, now we're building, now we're building. And here's the sticking point, right? Like this is these three words are the thing that we were talking around for that first, you know, sentence and a half. Mm -hmm. And for me, I feel like, again, you have to turn on the voice in your head, allow it to go slow, and allow yourself to reread as many times as it takes to understand it. So certainly yes. reading philosophy is not what I do on a daily basis. I read light fiction. And man, like, 
as soon as I get the like cadence of the author's writing in my head, we can just go. But for me, with nonfiction, particularly something this dense, I'm going to be mm. rereading that three or four times. And I may not play with character voice, but I will play with pacing and pitch and tone. And where's the turn in the sentence? Like, because all too often, the denser, the more sort of heavy a nonfiction book is, the less they're going to pivot where you see it coming, if that mm. makes sense. Right? Mm. Like, if I'm reading one of my cozy mysteries, the pivots are all on, but, however, therefore, right? Like, but, and you see them coming. I can read ahead enough as I am saying words. My mind is two sentences ahead from the words I am saying out loud. I have no prayer of doing that in nonfiction this dense. And so just giving yourself the space to go back and be like, I did not understand. We're going to do it again. Oh, I love that you said that. I love, so this is a skill, everybody, that I think can be learned, which is what Liza is teaching us. When you're reading fiction, you're verbalizing the words that are being said, but you're also looking ahead a sentence or two to see who's saying it, to see sort of what's happening next so that you know how to present the current sentence. That sounds like you're speed reading, like you're trying to get ahead of yourself, but it's not. You read slowly, and even if you have to pause and look ahead and go, okay, Sam is saying this, now back, okay. And I, we do, I don't want you to interrupt your reading experience. I don't want you to be pulled out of the story, but what you might find, depending on how your brain works, is that actually pulls you deeper into the story because instead of thinking about your notifications on your phone and the dishes you got to wash, you're thinking, who's saying the next line? <laughs> or, oh, okay, and it gets you into that. And also you can sort of, if you scan quickly, you can see, you might see the word despondent. And then you go, oh, this person is currently feeling a little lost, a little sad. Okay, and that helps you in this current sentence read it as though the character is lost and sad. It makes a whole, uh, you know, it's a very different experience. You really can't do that with nonfiction because there are no emotions being presented. It's usually just facts and how-to kind of stuff. But what Liza is saying, which is giving yourself the permission to read it first, to get the gist of it and go, okay, I know where this is going. And then going back and read it again. I just had an experience with this. I've never done this before, but recently I picked up this really great book called Hiking with Nietzsche. So Nietzsche was a philosopher, Frederick Nietzsche. It's the greatest, it's one of the best books I've ever read because the author is a professor of philosophy in Massachusetts, Lowell. And when he was 19, he went hiking in the Swiss Alps where Nietzsche did all of his thinking and what have you. And he tried to capture the spirit of this philosopher. And so he wrote a memoir about that experience and in the memoir presented all of these really complicated philosophical ideas, but did it in a, like layman's terms, right? And what I've never done before is I actually read the book twice. And I've read books more than once, but I've never read a book back to back twice. And I decided yeah. I'm gonna do that this time. So what I did is I read it and I didn't allow myself to take any notes. I just enjoyed the book and I got a, a sense of the mental landscape of where this book was going. And as I read something that I thought, that's something I would highlight or take notes on, I just thought, that's a good one. But I kept reading. Then when I came around the second time and read it, when I saw those sections again, I'm like, there's that thing. And it's still really good to me. Then it was worth taking notes on and highlighting. But it's like, if you ever, a quick analogy here is I, I went on this hike up of the canyon. It's called Adams Canyon. And I went the first uh, time by myself. And it was a sort of complicated path to try and find where we were going, but the end payoff is this big waterfall. And then a week later, we took I took my family, but because I'd already been on the trip, I knew where to go and I knew all of the obstacles and I knew how to negotiate everything and I knew it would be worth it in the end, right? As my kids were like, oh, my feet hurt and stuff. So that's something that you can do when you're reading is consider reading the book twice if it's going to be hard. First time, just yes. read it. Second time, get your notes out and be like, okay, now I'm going to be a student. I know where the lay of the land is. I know where the obstacles are. I've got some questions in my mind because I know when I read it the first time, I didn't quite understand these ideas. Now, when I go through the second time, I'm going to be looking for those things and I'm going to be ready to answer those questions. So it was really great for me. So, No, I think know. it's so true. It's so true. And it's funny. I feel like there's like an inverted bell curve of mm. people who read and reread and reread. Right. There's mm -hmm. like my five year old who's learning how to read and we are going to read mm -hmm. those Piggy and Gerald's. 
so many times, right? <laughs> so there's she's she's up here. She is rereading like yeah. crazy, right? And yeah. then there's this like, oh no, I'm good at reading. I don't need to reread. No, I'm fine. And that's so many adults live in that space. Mm-hmm. And then you look at people who, as you say, like are philosophy professors or who just have studied these mm-hmm. unbelievably thick, deep works. They've read that book twice a year for the 30 years they've been teaching about Emily Dickinson, right? Mm -hmm. And so it comes right back up again. And it's amazing to me the, I don't know what happened in American elementary schools in the 80s, that everybody associates rereading with not being a good enough reader. Yes. And it's the furthest thing from the truth. Mm -hmm. I read for a living, and I read every book two and a half times. Mm -hmm. And I say a half Mm because the first is largely, like, moving quickly because I'm trying to decide if, when I'm offered a book, if I'm a good fit for it, right? I Mm -hmm. should not be the person narrating a work of fiction about someone who's not my ethnicity playing soccer in a foreign country, which I I know none of those things. But I 100% want to read you the cozy mystery about the small town, like... Yes, please. I was chef's kiss. I would love that. And then I sit down and I prep the book. I am reading slow. I am rereading. When I hit a new character, what is their body like? Like, what's their physicality, right? Like, are they a big guy? Or are they like a little girl and they're just feeling kind of like, what's that's going to affect everything? Yeah. We're taking notes. Yeah. We're whatever. And then I'm living it. The lights are on in the studio. I am alone and I am living that book. I am sighing when they sigh. I am leaning back when they sit back in the chair. No one's like, Liza, you're such a bad reader because you reread. Like, no one's ever said that. And it's amazing that we ascribe this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in fact, I think people would probably be somewhat envious of you. I think, I feel like we are all tired of just being so plugged in and being so connected on a digital landscape. I think so many people reject me. And when I started this podcast, I had no idea, but I get messages daily of people who are like, thank you for helping me slow down. Like, thank you for reminding me that I've got to stop and just like chill out. And I think a lot of us are just really hungry for that, like permission to like turn everything off and just read that and reread something two or three times and just enjoy it and not feel the pressure to be so successful all the time. Yes. Well, I know that I'm already past our hour mark with you. You've been super oh, no, gracious sorry. to hang out with me. So no, I, I, uh, but I, I do want to point out really quickly, if you have just a second, I always like to try and give one book recommendation to the people mm-hmm. listening, something that I feel is super valuable. And this is a book recommendation I think you will actually really enjoy too, Eliza. So it's a trilogy called Bear Town. I just got into this. I'm through the first book right now. Mm-hmm. It's written by Frederick Bachman. I think that's okay. his name. Let me see here. Yeah. F-R-E-D-R-I-K, yeah. Bachman. Okay. Have you heard of this book before? No, Bear Town. No. The Bear Town? Okay. So Bear Town. Now, here's the thing, everybody. If you're listening to this, I don't often recommend fiction. I'm usually in the nonfiction space, right? Mm. But this book is something I think you'll all enjoy for several reasons. It was um, recommended to me in the book club that I host, and people started reading it, and I have not seen this much good response on a book recommendation from everybody in the club in a long time. But what it is, it's a story about a small town out in the middle of nowhere that's obsessed with hockey. So now mm. you might think, I'm not a sports person. I'm not going to read this. It's not, I, I don't, mm. I'm done, right? I'm not a sports person either. And I thought I wouldn't read this. But for whatever reason, this isn't about sports. This book mm. is about being human. And it he, he is probably, this is sort of a heavy compliment to give. He's probably one of the best fiction writers I've ever read because he somehow has figured out how to take what it means to be human and honestly put it on the page. And I swear to you, two or three times a page, you're going to just like have your fart just like blown open. Like, how do you, not in a bad way, but like in a really good way. Like, okay, good. He's like, I don't know. (laughs) No, it's not a sad. Well, I mean, there are sad parts Uh, in it, but he somehow figured out how to take what it means to be 
way too excited about something and obsessed about something to mm -hmm. completely devastated by things to being in love to like being betrayed he's got like every possible human emotion and all these amazing characters and when he puts it on the paper i've just never seen an author most authors when they try and do it they're really heavy-handed you know mm. they're and it's just like okay but we're talking about feeling it like you can't help but feel all of these emotions when yeah. you're reading it it's and yeah, it's about hockey, but it's not, you're not reading about hockey. You're reading about people's obsession with this sport. And the cool thing is people in Beartown either love hockey or they hate it. And you go through all of these different heads and it's just so good. So if all of you are looking for a, a piece of fiction that is an easy read, but will just make you feel all of the beautiful and the hard things about being human and you want to completely escape, this guy's got it figured out. And they made an HBO special out of it, too. I haven't oh. looked into it yet. I think it's actually nice. done in a foreign language, but yeah, it's beautiful. And I haven't read the, the other books in the trilogy yet. I believe it's a trilogy, but the first book has floored me. So wow. consider Bear Town Lovely. by Frederick I would. So, All right. So last but not least, if people are, I know we have a lot of people in our community who are independent authors. People are sending me their books all the time to review. I don't generally review those those just because I've already got thousands of books I'm trying to review from people like Aristotle and have you. But I do want those people to be served. And if they're looking to get their book narrated, I would assume that you're probably a, a good option for that. Are you looking for clients right now? Yeah, I'm booking a few months out, but I'm also always happy to just answer any questions. I find um, nice. a lot of independent authors have a lot of questions and either feel funny asking them or aren't sure where to look for reliable information, you're welcome to email me. I am happy, happy, happy to answer any questions or talk about the process. It's, I know I love audiobooks and I'm low-key obsessed. And I forget sometimes other people may not be. So yeah, if you have any questions or if you've managed to listen to an hour of my voice and thought that was okay, <laughs> then for sure hit me up and uh, I'd love to hear about your projects. Nice. What's the best way for them to reach you? My email, probably. And there's a form on my website and the website is just lizajacob.com, L-I-Z-A-J-A-C-O-B.com. Perfect. Liza, thank you so much for spending uh, this time with us and teaching us how to read slowly and allow the voices in our head to actually have some space. I think that is a really valuable skill to have. Don't be ashamed if you're a slow reader. Instead, embrace it. And uh, I think you'll enjoy your reading much, much more. Awesome. Thank you for All right, everybody, having. thank you so much for listening. If you found this episode of the Readable Podcast helpful in any way, I would really appreciate it if you could take just a second to go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. We're up to 28 reviews right now, which is really, uh, really great. A couple of weeks ago, we only had 18. And uh, this past week, we've had 10 really good ones. So thanks for taking the time out of your busy day to write that review. And until next week, remember to read slowly, take notes, and apply the ideas. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you'd like to take your reading to the next level, then head on over to our website at thereadwellpodcast.com. There you can get access to my weekly newsletter as well as up-to-date show information. Also, don't forget that I learned software development on the side just so that I could build a program to help us make better book notes as we read. If you're interested, go to highlightish.com. Think of highlighting a book, but add ish, I-S-H, at the end. Highlightish.com. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you on the next show.